And welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Big Challenges in Data Modeling, Data Modeling Design Problems, sponsored today by CA Technologies, makers of Irwin, moderated by Karen Lopez. Just a couple points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag BCDmodeling, Big Challenges in Data Modeling. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of this session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you the moderator for the webinar series, Karen Lopez. Karen is a Senior Project Manager and Architect at InfoAdvisor. She specializes in the practical application of data management principles, and Karen is a frequent speaker and in panelist on professional data issues. She's a Microsoft SQL Server MVP, specializing in data modeling and database design. She's a member to the DEMA International Board and a member of the advisory board of Zachman International. She wants you to love your data. Joining Karen this month are three esteemed a guest panelist, Donna Burbank, VP of Product Marketing at CA Technologies. Donna has more than 15 years of experience in the areas of data management, metadata management, and enterprise architecture. She's worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the U.S., Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly in, at industry conferences. She has authored a number of data-centric books, including Data Modeling for the Business and Data Modeling Made Simple with CA Irwin Data Modeling R8. David, President of Essential Strategies, Incorporated. David has been in the information industry, so it was called data processing, and he has been in producing the models to support strategic and requirements planning for more than 25 years. Dave has worked in a variety of industries, including, among others, banking, clinical, pharmaceutical research, and all aspects of oil production and processing. Prior various aspects of defining corporate information architecture, identifying requirements and planning strategies for the implementation of new systems. And Tom Biltz, lead database designer at Westfield Insurance. Tom is the lead database designer at Westfield Group, a super regional insurance, banking, and financial services group of business, head of business headquartered in Westfield Center, Ohio. Tom has 36 years of IT experience with over 24 years in the data management arena. Tom is the president of the CA Technologies Modeling Global User Community. And if you be at the at the Enterprise Data World Conference next week, you can meet them all in person. So welcome, Karen, and our panelists. And with that, I will turn it over to Karen to get us started. Hello, and welcome. Yeah, thanks, Karen. That's great. Um, uh, you're doing a great job here making all these things happen. I'm always in awe. Um, every, if you're having any sort of of technical issues, audio issues, screen issues or something, feel free to pop those questions over into the Q&A session and Shannon will help you right out. If you have a question for the panelists, uh, also put those in the Q&A and we're also trying to keep an eye on Twitter because all of us are uh, very experienced multitaskers, I assure you, and we're all on Twitter, that's great. Um, I also want to thank, again, CA Technologies for sponsoring this because that's what makes these things happen. And I love if you tweet about these things, even if you're a lurker tweeter, uh, that really helps us. And using that hashtag helps us follow that BCD modeling, like big challenges in data modeling. And I already started to put some tweets out there, and so will all panelists because they're great multitaskers. Guys? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so today, today's topic is about data modeling design problems, and you know, the title's pretty good. I really want to talk about the challenges we have as data architects and developers, EBAs, in uh, addressing some of the more common design issues, patterns that happen um, as we go about trying to not just do logical data models, but to build models that can actually build solutions. And whether those solutions are uh, homegrown database designs or XM messages or anything like that, I think it's really important that we talk about some of these things that we're doing. So I want to start off, though, with the first question, because this is one of the contentious things that I deal with. And I, think I, want, to start with, I want to start with Tom first. Um, how much design 
do data architects do in your experience, both your experience at your company and also what you hear in your urban user group? It's um, an interesting question in terms of, of many years ago, I'd probably answer that a little different than I would today in oh, that uh, I don't um, start with a blank sheet of paper anymore, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, and I think like any uh, experienced data modeler, you, you have your own repertoire of, of, I would call them patterns or so forth. And uh, I also use an industry model uh, in my work. And so in terms of design, there, there Make no make no mistake that there there's design involved even with an industry model. It's just that you know it kind of gets that grunt work out of the way and gets you started. So, mm -hmm. so um, do you, where's the trust in your organization normally between sort of the uh, modelers and physical modelers? Okay. Data yeah. eight architects do you physical models even if. So one thing I tell people is most of my physical models that I'm creating from scratch, like that blank sheet of paper thing, are uh, not for building databases as much. They might be one-off tables, extensions to packages or something, but most of mine are for integration layers, right? Staging databases or or ESBs or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, my my doll uh, works pretty well in my current position in terms of uh, I do – the low model, and I do the first cut of the physical model, and it's kind of thing I enjoy. It's something I, uh, I like. I, I sort of like knowing just enough about that database. So it's kind of you kind of uh, dance that line where sometimes I, I step on a DBA toe, but not real, real often. But uh, <laughs> but you know, I I think I my uh, stand in, in, into that design and and all them. I think that's a, that's a real critical thing of, of sort of crossing into that logical to the physical layer that uh, people that are logical modeling people need to know some of that physical world because early you made the comment of, of models that actually actually deliver solutions and that was a really good choice of words because you know your logical model is going to have yeah. to actually deliver a solution. Usually, yeah. So Dave, what do you think? What's been your experience about how much physical design uh, data architects do? Well, in my particular case, I've not done very much of the physical design. Uh, I have pretty much all my work cut out for me to try to get a model that really represents the nature of the business. And uh, as often as not, that gets turned over to other people. The point is that I charge a lot for the kind of modeling I do, and uh, they don't want to, to hire me for that much to do physical design. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they hire the people who are much more competitive at that than I am. Uh, occasionally had the opportunity to take a model and uh, you know generate a physical design and get all among and foreign keys and uh, the uh, uh, constraint all of the stuff that's along that and I say uh, maybe not and I people who are much better at that than I am uh, so point is correct that go ahead I'm gonna ask you so since you brought up so foreign key constraint and and um, maybe value constraints and valid values. Um, what else can I think of? Well, it's so, not so much that. It's it's that if if I have a a, a couple of levels deep set of subtypes, and a couple of relationships to the supertypes, then those get all replicated to the subtype tables. Um, you have to track the name convention such that you can figure out what exactly it is that they're pointing to, and this gets gets very tedious very quickly. At least yeah, so, like me. <laughs> right. So the reason I was just uh, uh, pouncing on those terms is one of the things, like Tom talked about doing first cut database design, which is how I describe the physical designs. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly not a DBA, and I have to work with so many target DBAs that I possibly um, have enough time to master at a mm -hmm. professional level all that knowledge. Right. I mean, it's just more of separation of duties and separation right. of duties, right. I call it. Um one of the questions I run into all the time is how much is enough? So I've worked with um, data architects who feel that even picking a primary key, a candidate primary key even, or mm -hmm. guessing at a primary key is way too physical for what a data architect should do, all the way to others who think maybe it'll light stored procedure coding and, and be able to figure out how to partition the table and making decisions yeah. on whether a foreign key should be enforced well, or the, the an index. Yeah, decisions that have to be made, as I 
basic see it, uh, before you can even automatically generate it, is first of all, how to address subtypes. Uh, this depends on how they're being used. If, if basically everybody is looking at the supertype and that's what all the queries are going to be, and there isn't much variation among the subtypes, then you do it that way. But if the subs are all very specialized and there are a lot of different people that are doing that way, then you do that. Uh, so not, not, this is not the text. It's not a technical issue in the sense that you're dealing with the nuts and bolts of the database, but, but you're saying, okay, there are usage issues that have to be addressed in the design. And uh, I use a lot of computed attributes, which I discovered a long time ago is a really profound way to be able to describe what's going to model. And I learned the first time I had software that did that, that, well, it's really nice if you have software that will automatically, you, you put a formula in there instead of the, the value and you ask to do a query calculator, but have a lot of those and they're all dynamic and you ask a question, suddenly the lights dim. Yeah. Um, so there is a design decision. There's a design decision. Does that calculation happen when you're bringing the data in, or is it something you can do dynamically when you do queries? Exactly. And it's those kinds of trade-offs that the, you know, are part of design. I think, too, and I think a lot of data architects don't understand all of the physical trade-offs. Like, we design yeah. beautiful logical models and first-cut mm -hmm. physical models that make DB just want to run for the eye bleach. And, <laughs> you know? So Donna, yeah. what's been your experience with how much physical design data architects do? Um, I, I would say uh, I do these things all over the map, and I think in, in you know depending on the size of the company, and I think changing roles, I'm seeing more and more people kind of wear a lot of hats. But typically, the data architect is at the the business and definitely the logical layer. Um, I think you know, ideally it would work in the way that Tom described. Maybe there's some light design, but I definitely, I think the majority is it's almost two separate camps. And I, I think in a way that's a risk that you, you kind of hit on it and maybe create a little controversy on the call. You know, is it too much to get this perfect business design that then, you know, in the extreme cases, the DBA goes, yeah, whatever, that's too hard. I'm going to throw it all in one table because that's yeah. easier to build one table rather than seven. Uh, and all that away. So, so where's that just enough? And I think, I think in a way we've matured as an industry. I like Tom's comment of, you know, I think a lot of these patterns, and I know, you know, I know uh, David has done a lot of work on patterns. We've kind of got some of that right. But I think one of the things I could criticize us on is maybe we spend too much on analysis paralysis and w therefore it's not used. Oh. So how can you do that just? Hey, I believe to have that conversation. Sorry, David, did you have a comment? Or? I, I, I think that that process of translating between two is where the where the, you know is the heart of it, and what you have to do is to get the the uh, the business person or the business analyst together. Well, actually, it's, there's some business people involved too. The, the modeler on the one hand and the designer on the other hand, and there are questions that you ask the business people about: How are you going to use this? Mm -hmm. And very specific translations you can make if they're going to use it this way as opposed to if they're going to use it that way. And and you can just sort of go down the list and say, well, all right, how do this? And it's the it's the of it that will determine the answer to that question. And That's there's a process point. in the middle of doing that translation. Yeah, often business. I think we're used to having business people involved in the logical design. I think it's less. Mm -hmm. I think it's equally important. I agree, but I don't know if we always do have that. How is it going to be used? Discussion. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you right. do you do that in your company with the business people? Yeah. You know, that this is going to be used from uh, the developer DBA perspective or the business perspective. So, I'm doing from the business, business perspective. perspective. Yeah, business perspective. You know, we get that that sure. Uh, you know, at the same time, uh, I think one of the faults we have as uh, as logical data modelers is we don't involve the DBA up front. But I've also so I've seen DBA say, oh, I don't necessarily want to be involved in all these meetings, but they still want to be involved. So <laughs> it, it's an interesting dilemma. <laughs> and, yeah. and I might add to the comment earlier, you know, we, we have a situation where if you start moving over into that physical world, uh, I have to watch myself that my logical yeah. designs don't become too physicalized. So. Actually, that's but, but again, a great point. I have a, I have a blog post on data diversity about the Mason-Dixon line of the Zachman framework about trying <laughs> to people. There's a line there that I see, a horizontal line, um, mm -hmm. you know, where people are the most comfortable.
comfortable working. There are some really wonderful people who can walk, you know, who can work in data column all the way up and down or at a row all the way across. But for the most part, you know, most people either like to think about building stuff or they like to think about solving business problems and, you know, to find that right trade-off along that Mason-Dixon line. And for those of you who might not know, Mason-Dixon line is a cultural divide um, in the U.S. to describe different belief systems and everything. And, and <laughs> it's a point of view, uh, yeah, as we've got people up here laughing and people down there below the line laughing, um, mm -hmm. is that, um, that, you know, I think it's like, like you know, Pulling people across those lines is good to get people to stretch themselves and understand. Like I've, I've been in meetings where you know, it is kind of embarrassing if data architects can't look at an actual, let's say, a create table statement and read it. Like there's a certain amount mm -hmm. of uh, design literacy that we data architects mm -hmm. need that we be able to, to look at, you know, DL and be able to understand it. Maybe not choose the right way to do all that stuff, but to be able mm -hmm. to read it and participate and participate in that discussion. Good. Um, so now that we've spent a few time talking about just sort of the nature of some of the issues, the point of view, I want to switch into just a few examples of some of the more common design issues that I, I deal with. Um, one of them that I that comes up a lot for me is I'll be a data architect design in the model something very beautiful in a logical model, like a recursive relationship for a hierarchy and represent a ragged hierarchy. A ragged hierarchy is one, if you think of an org chart where it has multiple levels but not all the same levels. So you might have the CEO having some other C-level people report to them, and they might have some VP, some senior VPs reporting to them. But in one of those eggs, maybe the VP has no more people reporting. Let's call him the VP of special projects. The VP of special projects has no people reporting to him. But they go on and you have VPs that have HR, finance, IT reporting to them. And they might go down you know, another 50 or 60 levels. But eventually they all stop. But it's called a ragged hierarchy because um, it, it's not just a pyramid like, like hierarchy. And in a logical model we can design those and, and have this nice recursive relationship pointing back to its parent. But real physical world, that's really difficult. You you have just touched on you touched on one of the, my biggest griefs about the dear old sequel. Uh, <laughs> I spent many years in manufacturing systems, and the product structure was the guts of any manufacturing system. That's right. And uh, uh, you know, COBOL programmers figured out how to deal with it, which was fine. Used a product. Uh, in the early 80s, that had manufacturing system functions. And one of them was uh, explode the product structure. It, does, it takes care of exactly what you said. And it goes to each wing as far as it goes and quits, and then goes to the next wing and goes as far as it goes and quits. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. And that was exactly the way the world should work. And, and I must confess that it gave me bad habits as a data modeler because I assume that you know you can do that. <laughs> and I started work at Oracle, and I discovered that Oracle ostensibly has a, a, a command for that. I can't remember what it was. But lets you do that kind of an explosion. Oh, by the way, you cannot actually join descriptions with structures. So if you're willing to have a product structure that has a lot of part numbers, you know, you're great. But if you'd like to have part numbers with the description, uh, you can't do that. Yeah. So, so one of the this, one of the issues, David, is that uh, in with these right. So you're right. The exploding them also expensive. Uh -huh. But the issue is where you need to insert a level. So in org chart example, if someone decides mm -hmm. that you know you have divisions reporting to mm -hmm. uh, the departments reporting to divisions, and now all of a sudden mm -hmm. someone came along and decided we need zones in the middle there. That mm -hmm. the the cost of now updating all those recursive relationships can well, be that's expensive. That, and and so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Well, so there are all these tricks for how to mm -hmm. physically implement one of these hierarchies. And one of the great resources for this is Joe Selko has a book just on right. and mm -hmm. called uh, Joe Selko's Tree and Hierarchies. Um, mm -hmm. I, like, I do that all the time because it's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
it has all these ways of dealing with yeah. not just modeling a hierarchy, but modeling a hierarchy and building a solution that will be used the way a hierarchy has a tendency to be updated. Mm -hmm. Right, right so exactly. If you're have lots of inserts in the middle, do it this way. If you're going to be just mm -hmm. updating the values, do it that way. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is that the tools are not is not as good as they should be. I, is is my right. conviction that the tools make blame it the easier tools. to do that. Well, there, 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 there are. I know. I, I, your your point is your point is correct. But I'm sitting here saying I know it can be done, and yeah. uh, it's a pity I had the experience that it actually can be done and it can be done well, but just not in SQL. Interestingly enough, I'm dropping in here. I once had lunch with. Uh, um, and and I groused about that. Why is, did SQL not have a function that lets you do a, a uh, recursion like that? And I said, well, actually, it did. He designed it. There was a there was an argument you could put on a SQL statement that was okay. Just explode this on as far down as it goes. But the M and its wisdom thought, no, nah, that's too clever or too sophisticated <laughs> or something. And they just didn't include it in the product, and it's never been there ever since. Right. There are some commercial RDBMSs that have. Um, hierarchy features. I'll just call them that. It'll be very vague. Okay. Both okay. for inserting, retrieving, um, exploding them and everything. And I don't have a lot of experience mm -hmm. with them, but this comes back to the point of should I sure um should I make sure that I understand the difference between just like to a business person, I can describe a hierarchy in a data model. I mean very easily. Mm -hmm. Very common yeah. 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 when it comes to implementing it, that might not be the solution. <laughs> Exactly so, and and that's uh, and this is designers are in their are in their keep, and I have respect for that. Anna, Tom, you have anything to add to this? Well, I've definitely experienced that problem firsthand, and as you say, the first if that time some realignment comes, then 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 I'm to pay right <laughs> because of that realignment, and uh, you know I found an ideal solution for that other other than flattening the data. You know, some uh, yeah. sort of like and, and well, if if, if you have if you have the model, say it's an organization, and you have the structure of the thing that can you know round through it as many levels as you want. If you insert something in there that's not a big deal to that model, uh, but depending on what kind of tricks you use to implement it, then you're right. It's uh, maybe an issue. Excellent. Yeah. Yes, this. Yeah, go ahead. Of course, the importance of that. Logical model because technology changes and, and we don't uh, sometimes the negative of, of implementing for a specific physical solution is that it masks exactly. the business need. So it's, this is the need. This is how we have to do it for now. Hopefully, if something comes along, we can implement it better. That's fine, but let's not mix that with that's not how the business wanted it. Exactly. Good point. Um, now I, I want to into another. Uh, one of my other things that I run into is one of my hardest design decisions. It's actually a logical modeling decision too, but it, where it really becomes important is in the physical side. Is this trust between high generalized models, very very specific models, and that I mean, do we have something like a, a, a specific model might have a, an entity or table for invoice, shipping notice, order. Uh, receive document, uh, return, or you might implement a generic concept of like uh, in one model I work with, it's called an inventory control document, which could be subtyped into those things. But you generalize it because all of those things have a high number of not just attributes and views in common, but also very similar workflow requirements, like they're used very much the same. So it would be a generalized implementation as you have inventory control document versus a separate entity or table for everything else. But um, in your experience of helping people try to decide how generalized they want to go, or what are some of the issues with going generalized versus specific? You know, I'm a big fan of the conceptual data model, um, mm -hmm. and one of the folks in the questions had talked about reuse, and to me that that's key to, is to do have that gen whatever you call it, having that generalized layer. It really to me is a separate model in the layers. So you, you know, here's this thing called invoice, and that has a de de definition, and there's attributes about that that are same that might be reused in other models, and even at the logical level, you may instantiate that with 
with things like attributes, that those can be used and might be taken off and made into separate tables mm. in different physical databases. But the core of invoiceness or whatever example I use, <laughs> that should be that should be the same. You know, and everyone has the idea of this design layer architecture where you can literally have these separate models that derive into others. Right. So you can have this central logical for an example and then state that differently on Oracle, SQL Server, Teradata, but then you don't lose that mapping. So it's kind of the best of both right. worlds of, yes, right. these are the common attributes. I implemented it differently on DB2 for a particular reason, but it's still the same thing. Or at least oh, you brought, up, you brought up an even, uh, an even different issue, which is actually also some of the, the true data modeling design issue, is that how do you support um, differences you know, between a logical expression of your data model, your logical model, and all the several physical things, also a really important design consideration. Uh, but uh, I can't to you the fact that what I was really talking about is in one particular physical model, how you decide whether to take a generalized, more abstract approach to design something or sticking with the specific tools. And I think over the years we've uh, definitely like when I first started modeling, the trend was very specific. You know, you had even if you had subtypes, you had lots of subtypes. You had very specific things for the generalized approach. So in my example, inventory control document, I'd have a document type, and the document types would be invoice, uh, shipping notice, receiving document, those things. Um, but we wouldn't necessarily have separate tables for them, uh, even. And so generalized. Approach Approach. What it allows you to do is someone comes up with a new document type, we don't have to change our database, and in theory we don't have to change our code, although you might have to, um, to deal with workflows. That's kind of what I was talking about. So I totally answered the wrong question. That's okay, I've you answered a great part. question. You answered <laughs> a great question. I should go into politics. I just created my own question. Sorry, right. you answered the question. <laughs> well, I'll answer that one then if, if I get a second try. And I think it's a balance, like anything, and, and we've learned a bit. I, I think preference is a bit of generalization because my frustration is to be in a database where there's a separate table for, like, now I can't remember your example, but, you know, employee with red hair and employee with green hair. You, know, <laughs> you can't have all of these. But I think we can also go too far and show that obfuscate the model, and it's too general. Party might be one where people argue back and forth. Is that scenario? You don't know what it is anymore. Mm -hmm. So I know that's a general answer, but I think it depends in each case. I think in general, it's better to generalize so you don't have wasted tables. Just don't take it too far so you have a thing table that can, you know, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think it's about a good choice of words, Donna and, Karen and David. I mean, uh, I, what I mean by that is uh, I favor generalizing if it makes sense. In other words, everybody, I think, understands what party is, and you see that generalized quite a bit, right? But but sometimes I've seen like all types of contracts or policies and whatever being called an agreement, and not everybody understands that. And I think the reason why it's to choose the right words on that physical side is because things have changed over the years, and one of the things that's changed is we have a lot of end user uh, business access into into these physical databases. Now they can be masked in a, in, a, in a view certainly. But uh, who wants to constantly rename? It's, you'd sort of like to be able to find an object through, through you know, it's passed, you know, through the database and mm -hmm. into the report, into the query, whatever. So uh, I, I like to use generalization. Um, sometimes you, you get into some RI issues, you know, as you, as you need to yeah. start enforcing reference integrity. If your house and you've all in a typed entity, then that, that becomes an issue too. So. Yeah, you, you've really done something very important with this trade-off because I've seen more um, – like I said, like you even brought up party. So when I first started doing my data modeling contentious issues presentation, gosh, more than 15 years ago, and party was one of the contentious issues at the time. Virtually no one was implementing a couple of big companies that were doing it, most insurance companies. Um, but I give that presentation where people vote on the value of – you know, how they feel about something contentious, I mean, it, it has completely flipped. The majority of people see the value in it, but they're not always able to implement it because the business hasn't bought into it. Uh, but that just shows how our approaches to data modeling and design have changed, you know, over a decade. Uh, I think that it's an important thing. The other is 
is you about enforcement. So when we have really specific tables and columns and everything, we can use the DBMS to enforce all these constraints. But when you start generalizing things, now it's all to the application code to make sure that document, thing like that. Yeah. And I think that that's the trade-off. The other trade-off is while people love them, because it allows us to have agile data, not agile data modeling, but agile data. We can just update data and support new business requirements. But most developer tools still want to do all their work by dragging a table, dragging a column, and don't have a feature for saying, when the value of this column is A, you know, we'll do this. They have to hand write all that. And I think that's the trade-off. I have this problem before we even get to design, and that is to how how abstract or how concrete to make the model in the first place. Because the process in in getting there is you do what I'm calling the semantic models, which are the models very much in the user's language, uh, which winds up with lots and lots and lots of entity types because everybody has his own set of things that he's interested in. Mm -hmm. And the exercise is to bring those together and to come up with some kind of of abstraction. That encompasses all of those things, and bring those people together to at least recognize this abstraction is is not easy. And so a lot of these conversations that you have between the model and the programmer is the same process have between the being the modeler and the and the uh, uh, user community. And um, um, important to remember the conversations because then when you go to the physical design, it's probably very appropriate to be much more specific to the community. But in doing that, be sure that you're making the right translation. And, uh, uh, but but the, the underlying issues are the same. And that you want an enterprise-wide system that serves a lot of people, then each of the individuals has to sort of accommodate, okay, how you use the moral language. And similarly, if you want a system that is more general purpose, then the individual functions have to do have to do that. Now, in terms of the rules, uh, I found in modeling, yes, if, if, if for example, I do a lot of you know parameter tables or parameters, and different kinds of, where where an attribute is specific to a particular subtype, uh, so sitting there and it can go to anything, and so I have an yep. additional entity that is the rule. As this particular kind of thing here can work for this subtype of say party, you know, the, only some of these can go to a particular party type, yep. and so and that that actually works pretty well. Uh, it's a little tricky to explain, but it, 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 it does the trick. Right. So good point. This is related also. So we have a question in the Q&A from Eric about how about a generalization to the point of key value pairs. Definitely dealt with designs like that. As a matter of fact, I've been brought in to fix them. Um, <laughs> I use key value pairs quite a bit for just like you're talking about parameters of something where, mm -hmm. you know, especially on products in a, in a retail mm -hmm. model or something like that where, you know, the, the the sort of descriptive information we have about a product. I mean, it so varies by the type of product, and then there's new new ways of dealing with these. I mean, you know, the the values that describe a TV just seem to change every five minutes. So if we tried to model those with a you know a table of you know it's 3D technology type, we'd just be constantly churning that database to the point we wouldn't even be put data in it. We'd just be updating it all the time. So, but what do you think, uh, Tom? Have you dealt with any designs that have uh, key value pairs? You say, uh, "Here's the and here's the value." You know, uh, uh, you know, an awful lot. And if I implement my industry model as presented, yeah. not everything is type. So, so you'd have to use that that type in, in addition to another sort of natural key and um it makes it difficult it really does so so yeah. a, a design that i like to avoid <laughs> i know <laughs> when many times when my models become physicalized they may see some changes in that particular area so yeah exactly donna i've seen the need i I think there's not a great answer right now with the relational model. I know where our team is doing some research with a, you know, some yeah. universities of how you really create this kind of. You, I think it's not just far. 
the key value pairs, but other technologies too. Is there this common data model that's valid for XML or big data? So that was one of the questions, which is often key value pairs. That, that's kind of a side. For, we, we talk about a logical data model is still very relational. Is there a logical yeah. data model that's non-relational that then we can still reuse those pieces? I just don't think we're there that yet. There's an industry. I've seen some prototypes, but I don't think any tool has gotten that quite right yet. Mm -hmm. So we kind of make strange workers to make it kind of relational. But as you guys know, that's not the really yeah. the right thing. So yeah. we're having a great right now. So that's a great segue mm -hmm. into um, one of the questions I had, which is, you know, I still think of a logical data model of, I mean, I've used it to uh, to implement relational databases, XML schemas, uh, hierarchical, they're not relational at all, um, you know, kinds of data stores and messages and everything. And so in my mind, I think that I can use an ERD, which you said is based on relational thought. I can still take those thoughts and implement them in a wide variety of target data stores or, or other types of data structures. And so in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking that capturing requirements and thinking about, you know, things like what are the data types and what are the constraints and all of those things for that data, and I still think about putting them into non-relational data stores. But that's been one of the big uh, criticisms of data architecture, data management, data modeling coming from the NoSQL community is, you know, all of our models are relational. We, they can't possibly be used. We must start from scratch. Um, are data architects supposed to respond to this issue of we think relationally or this, this action that we can only think relationally and that none of all that great, all those being locked in meeting rooms for hours and days now needs to be thrown out because we're implementing in Hadoop or something else like that? Who wants to tackle that? It's very hard not to think relationally. <laughs> um, in the sense that that they, I specifically am allergic to foreign keys appearing on my on my data models for that reason, because a foreign key is a relational implementation of the relationship. If the model consists of representations of things of significance and their relationships with each other, where the relationships are expressed as sentences, you know, subject at object, you know, this language, this is the world that they're in. And if it gets implemented in XML or it gets implemented in Hadoop or something else, the underlying definition or description of the business should not be affected. Um, my complaints about information engineering is, is that it bars the whole of a really complicated way of representing identifying relationships. Uh, pity because this relationship can be marked as identifying just with a little tick or something like that, and that's all you need to focus on what are the things and how are they related to each other. They're not the particularities of how they're going to get implemented. I've always tried very hard in the modeling part to be far away from even relational uh, technology as possible. Now, having said that, of course, modeling itself is, is uh, you know, did by or came into existence thanks to the relational theory. And that's certainly hiding back there. So any relational technology I think we should stay away from in our, in our what are architectural models as much as possible. Uh, logical model, I agree, tends to be sort of relationally biased. I think it's all about the relationship, though, is is what I think. You know, when 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 you when you're looking at sitting there with a business and trying to solve a problem, it's all about the relationship in the data. It, it's their business mm -hmm. role. It, it's it's what guides you to collect that piece of data. In, in almost any enterprise today, you know, you go in, everybody mm -hmm. wants to collect, you know, tell you an attributes about a customer, but somewhere something needs to tell you what you really need. And, and as you get into this world of big data, I, I think those relationships that exist, the business discussions are, are very critical, and, and, and it may manifest itself in, in a relational model, but people still need to understand relationships, no what technology. Technology. Relationships, absolutely. I agree. And, but to me, relationships are assertions about the nature of the business. And uh, a, a, any kind of big data or you know next generation of data management and so on has to ultimately come back to that. You brought up an interesting point, and 
use the information engineering doing this. So, of course, in the original uh, sort of information engineering notation, there weren't any um, in keys in the original tools anyway. Right. No. <laughs> in no. key columns didn't show up in mm -hmm. file tables, right? You actually just mm -hmm. saw the relationship listed. Mm -hmm. So you saw a list of attributes, and they mm -hmm. saw a list of relationships that came into that mm -hmm. table. Um, and it was the advent of IDEF 1X handling mm -hmm. notation, <laughs> which uh, requires showing of foreign keys. And now mm -hmm. it's the tool vendors, and I think pretty much all the tool vendors that, that support IDEF 1X and uh, what mm -hmm. they call IE, which is just a different flavor of IDEF, different exactly. notation, but still IDEF 1X, you can still turn off the showing of foreign keys on child tables. Um, and Even there, because I... I I, I my model show identifiers, and I, the notion that this relationship is an identifying relationship is very important, but you just put a tick on the relationship, and that's all you should have to do. Yes, the relationship, depending on which notation you choose, is drawn mm -hmm. differently, depending on whether it's identifying or not. So it all comes down to how much flexibility the tool vendors allow us uh, in what we want in our model and how we want to show it. Um, exactly. This is also sort of the influence of standards. So IDEF 1 X is a standard. Um, well, vendors want to be compliant with the standard, they follow the standard. Whereas mm -hmm. these other notations weren't standards, they were just notations mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. could adopt. So in those other notations, they could, vendors could have a little bit more flexibility in uh, in how they wanted to depict those. So I'm going to Donna, Donna, do you want to jump yeah, into this? I will. <laughs> Speaking as a vendor, that's, uh, there's the rub. Um, <laughs> You know, if you say you support a standard, you do support the standard, and that that's exactly. how it is. I think of what people are. I mean, the, the the industry is evolving, and I think the good news is people are wanting to show a, a, like a control model to a business user. In fact, some of the Q and A was on that as well. Um, so what we've done in the tool is very much how you experienced it. If at, at its crux, underneath the scenes, there is going to be that foreign key. You don't have to show it. I mean, you can show an mm -hmm. model that has only pictures, icons, mm -hmm. and no lines at all. It yeah. could look exactly like mm -hmm. a PowerPoint. So we have a little <laughs> flexibility. I know. I'm sorry, but I kid you, you not. Data diversity. Sir, mm -hmm. I want to point to the big challenge mm -hmm. in data modeling survey, which uh -huh. keeps me up at night. Um, uh -huh. Because when people ask, what's your most used data modeling tool? So Erwin is number one. We were pleased at that. And Vito is number two. And so uh, <laughs> there is because people want that just enough. I want to show something quick. Well, mm -hmm. it's probably free on their desktop. But it's that it's mm -hmm. more flexible. But then the negative mm -hmm. is you can't generate a data database at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So that, that was one of the struggles we did of how do you add that Visio or PowerPoint-like layer onto the real engine. And, and so it's not 100%, but we took a lot of steps. And it's kind of an un unknown. A lot of folks aren't using it as well as much because it is newer. Yeah. But the ability, you mm -hmm. could. You can you can hide everything and make it look blue and purple and have little pictures of people if you wanted. Um, <laughs> Accessible. Actually, my, my request is a little different from that. I, I don't dispute with the point you're making. Um, I grew up on the Oracle notation, uh, Richard Barker and, and Larry El Harry Elson's. And this is actually a very disciplined notation. And it's not, all, it's not so much the notation itself, because the notation is very simple. But it has the disciplined language around it. And very amusing that the new hot buzzword is, is semantics and, and semantic technology. And RDF is exactly the, the use of language, you know, for some years now in, in the data models. And all it is a, a line that has, you know, a solid piece and some dark text uh, for optional and closed feed or not. They say, I like to show the identifier, so I put a, put a character next to the attribute and I put a little tick mark on top of the relationship, and that's enough. Relationships, you know, to show identifiers. And then, you know, then, then we're done. I find it ironic, by the way, when I went and tried to do this all in UML, that actually if you use stereotypes for identifiers, which you had to do because UML didn't know about, stereotype, about identifiers, you stereotype next to the relationship or put a little stereotype next to the attribute, that does the trick very nicely. And you have, it doesn't change the shape of the uh, relationship of the uh, box, the any box, it doesn't change the kind of line that you're drawing, it just, it's just a little extra piece of information, which is very yep. nice. Mm -hmm. oh, great discussion about these things. And we're getting to our last 15 minutes. I want to make sure that we have time to answer some of the good questions we have in the Q&A and some in the chat that I spotted. But I wanted to bring up 
topic is that um, one of the things that I struggle with as a data architect as opposed to some other roles is finding out how other people have solved these problems. Um, it just seems, and I know some of you, Pat and I, have talked about this before, it seems like the data management, data modeling community doesn't do a lot of sharing of some of their questions and solutions. So the rest of the world seems to blog a lot about you know, how to solve a specific problem. So not blogging, like a lot of my blogging is done recently about the theory or love data or any of those things, but actually sharing, you know, here's what we tried to do, here's what we did, and, and yet all the other communities, the DBA community, the developer community seems to do a lot of blogging and tweeting and everything. But people contact me all the time is I can't find any blogs on how to do this in and how to solve this problem. What do you we why is it do you think that we're sharing some of our design problems and solutions or do you disagree? Anybody? I have an opinion. I'm not politically correct apparently. <laughs> 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 I tend to think that, that we're a community of like other folks. But I think if you look at developers, and, and, and they're open, and it's just sort of like like the kids today with texting and Twitter and stuff. You know, they they really do that. But you know, when I, I get in front of a group of people to try to convince them to even read my blog or, or to respond to something uh, on a message board, the answer is almost always, I don't have time to do that. And, and it's funny because if, if you had time to do that, you would probably solve your problem faster if we exactly. could do that. And I think it's just like a cultural thing right now. I don't know. So. Well, I'll jump in and be politically in, uh, incorrect too, but I'll start by saying I don't think we're as bad. I think we're a little hard on ourselves because, look, there's over 140 <laughs> people talking about challenges in data modeling today. So clearly, exactly. you know, there are people. But a part of it, and I can tease data architects because I am one, um, but we tend to be perfectionists, and I think there's a, uh, a, a no. science that sort of is in, I know, not that, it's sort of in <laughs> to, to discuss and say, I disagree with your theory, and you go back and forth. I think a lot of us don't want to put that out there because then we'll be seen as wrong. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I think that's part of it, too, of, you know, we have to have this perfect model and everything. If we show kind of the date out there, does that? make us look weaker. And I, I don't know, I, an interesting, interesting seminar with Lynn Silverstone that did a whole thing on right. character types. And, and that actually came up from many people in the audience. It's like, yeah, I'll send an IM and I have a typo. I have to send another one to correct it. Why do that? <laughs> I just, yeah, I do that too. Yeah. But I don't know. I think and, that's a piece of it. Right. It might make us great data architects, right? The detail-oriented yeah. needing to get it right. And so... Um, and I have heard the age thing, but I, you know, okay, so I'm very experienced. We're all pretty experienced. Um, but I work with enough experienced DBAs, experienced developers, and by I mean old, um, that I'm not quite sure uh, that it's that. And I do think it's more of one of the things I'm going to be doing at EDW next week is giving a short session on how to get started in blogging and, and some of this stuff. So I'm hoping to maybe encourage some more people to share some of these things. So good to on that. So I'm looking at some of the questions in the queue. And one of them from Carol, please compare and contrast the use of UML versus ERD for modeling. David, I bet you you have a session coming up someplace. Maybe I do. Is it EDW? It's at EDW. It's going to be 2 in the afternoon at 1 o'clock. Uh, and everybody to, to come there. And while you're at it, I have a book on the same subject, and I will be autographing it that same day at uh, okay. second. So you're actually, you're actually Carol, aren't you? No, <laughs> Carol. No, I didn't. I didn't plan that. I didn't plan that. <laughs> okay. Um, another question is: Do you see data modeling involving to accommodate the challenges of big data? So I kind of addressed that. That's from Rob. Uh, I kind of addressed that when I talked about NoSQL. Does anyone have a quick thought on that? I'm in hopes that big data. Well, big. Yeah, it's a new technology uh, with all kinds of stuff that I don't know anything about. I'll take, you know, you could use a starting point. At the very least, it had better be describing the business that we're trying to describe all the way along. And I hope that at least the, the essential models that I come up with are still going to be applicable 
it's a whole new technology for, for organizing the data. Donna? This is something we've been looking a lot at here at CA, and in, in some cases it's, it's two different camps, uh, unfortunately, in an organization, because it's really kind of turning what we do on its head. Instead of top-down, dine, and then build, it's really bought discover, and then fighters, but there's still patterns there. So, But we have seen some some success with teams working fairly well together. Uh, we have a success story on our site with Arts. The um, I know you're familiar with them, Karen. Yeah. Association mm -hmm. of Retail Standards. And that's an interesting method. We've seen some others do it as well. But you really use the big data as a source, really, that it's list another source of your data warehouse. So you take discovery. You do some filtering, clearly. You don't just dump everything from Twitter into your in the data yeah. warehouse, but are there patterns you've discovered on Twitter about your digital organization? With you were talking young, with the younger folks, twittering about what they buy, or you know, can you find patterns or maybe data um, you know, time of day of, of when people purchase? Maybe that makes sense, and we'd never tracked that before. That, that particular one was a nice way of kind of having that old and new. Because I, mean, I agree with David, you do need some, you know, companies struggling with now. I have this. How do I make sense of it? We're not 100 percent there with. The Tools. There's things like Hive that kind of have a SQL layer on top of it. It's you know, it's something we're getting, I, I'm seeing folks have some success with. We're not 100% there with the data modeling technology around it because, as I said, it's kind of a whole different thing. But yeah. there are companies kind of melding the two to some success. Yeah, interesting because when I think of big data, I mean, there really are two use cases. People who are consuming big data, like they're reading center data, like in retail video analytics and, and pushing patterns and it up with credit card purchases and what you said on Twitter and everything. And then the people who are using big data to kind of publish out stuff, and I shouldn't say big data, like no SQL technology, so related technologies, to push things, like to produce their product catalog and, and you know, create a stores for consuming of data for other people to consume. And I think that really changes where the data model fits in, because if you're wanting to consume external data that's just has large volume, uh, variety, velocity, all of those Vs, then you know, you're trying to take that data in and somehow make use of it within your structured data, within your traditional RDBSs. You're going to about how you model that data that's being stored. But if you're publishing data to Hadoop so that other people can, can send it, then you're going to think about it in a different way. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people you know, just think of big data as, one uses. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so that's a great question here. Uh, what happens when the business users um, are used to access access in the physical world and don't care about the logical model? That's something to you guys, has it? Uh, actually, is my biggest problem. Because, for example, the whole notion of how you do requirements analysis. You go interview people and you say, "What do you What do you need?" And they say, "Well, I need the system to work better." So you do in your What does your business need? Well, I say, "I don't know. What do you got?" Uh, so all they know is the current physical system, and so that has limited their ability to, to to you know think about the overall set of problems they're up against. What happens to that in the long run, Karen? Is that that you know the folks get out there and somebody gave oh you know somebody in a department oh my gosh I found out how I can use access and connect here and I'll, I'll take care of that stuff at IT you know <laughs> we'll take care of this for you you know but what eventually happens is they don't stand the data or the results they go gosh this line doesn't balance to the line you're telling me over here you know and so so guess what they come back and they ask do you do you like have something that shows me what this data how it kind of relates and they come back and they ask for the model. So, you know, mm -hmm. good point. Many, many continue that exploration <laughs> right. on their own. I do tell my teams that, you know, no one's going to love the logical model as much as the logical modeler does. <laughs> but I tell my teams that oh, they should respect <laughs> that's anybody who builds something. And you know, but they still need to respect it, that it has a role, and then it got them their physical model and got them their DDL and their XML messages and their canonical model and, and whatever else, and then it has an important role there, and that they'll see that importance as we build more and more physical models off that logical model. Uh, and I have a story of an end user who, you know, we finished one project, worked on and started a new project, and when the light bulb went off over his head, when he realized, that we had 80% of the work already done because we had done a logical model. 
and weren't just relying on a physical model, that we could take the logical model now and reuse a big chunk of it to solve this next business problem. He, he, the light bulb went off in his head, and he says, I'm never going to be on a project again where we don't use these things. So you know, he became our greatest cheerleader because he could see the value in that. Um, and think that, you know, it's really tough. A lot of times I'm brought in on a project usually to solve some database design problem, and no, virtually no one wants me to do the logical model until they start seeing some of the value of it's usually more uh, accessible to the end users. They see how the end users like reading it and how the end users hate reading the physical model. And that's really a presentation style thing mostly. They do start seeing the value of it. And that that's the type of stories I want to share with with other data architects about those difference. Um, I'm looking through the chat. Gosh, you guys are chatty. That's really good. I love that. Um, lots I, did, I chimed in, by the way, I, I, I your point about the blogs. Uh, strong recommendation to go to www.tdan.com. Because there's a lot of things, there are articles there, and which means that there are things that somebody put some thought to. And uh, they cover the cover the whole field, and this is what I recommend to everybody. Excellent. And and both Tom and Donna blog at uh, Irwin dot com as well. Is that correct? Tom does. And these were for me. For me. Yes. Yeah. That from Irwin dot com. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I have my own blog, and do you have a website blog? Um, I just like to see more people sharing their experiences or even sharing their questions. Like we have all these great questions and discussions going on in chat, and we'll be able to save that chat. But no one will really see that, and people can listen to the recording that's being made of this session and everything. But one of the great things about writing this stuff down, and data architects, we should be fans of writing stuff down. That's what we do. <laughs> is that you know they have these big index machines out there in the interwebs mm -hmm. that will go yeah, yeah, and help. Yeah. People find them, uh, you know, trying to find the audio from this. I mean, that technology exists. It's going to be different. Um, a lot of people in the chat brought up the fact that, yes, there are LinkedIn groups. There's uh, uh, for model vendors have groups, and then there's a data architecture group, and there's a Yahoo group that I run, uh, a mailing list for those of you more experienced, uh, DM Discuss. And there, there's all these places where people can have discussions, but great things about being able to write things, either it's article or blogs, is you know you can include graphics, you can include videos, you can include written media. It can all be indexed. It all has metadata. It, it you know it can be served up to people in lots of different ways. I, I think that's great, uh, and and dataversity as well. So I blog at dataversity.net, which is the hosts of these webinars. There's lots of great bloggers there and articles and videos and all these great resources. But I'd also like to hear. You know, people who work in the trenches, who are doing these things. And also, one of the biggest complaints I get is that um, there aren't enough how to do something in a tool stuff. That's what we're actually the weakest in, sharing that information. So years ago, what was popular were the forums, like the forums, the online forums I hosted, Info Advisors. But the participation of that has really dropped off. Um, I'd like to see people sharing those things. As so we get down into the last couple of minutes, uh, Don and Tom, what are you guys doing at Enterprise Data World? Uh, I'm facilitating the Irwin SIG on uh, Tuesday morning at 7.30. So any CA Irwin users are welcome to come and meet me. And a lot of CA Irwin folks will be there, uh, probably an awful lot of community members. So I'm happy to. I'll be at Tom's SIG or I get in trouble even though it's first thing in the morning. Fine, it's super <laughs> early. <laughs> I'll be doing a presentation on on Tuesday as well in the afternoon. Uh, we'll be making a big announcement that I can't say anything of yet, so stay tuned Ooh. to check the press releases on Monday. Um, and we'll have a, a new partner we'll be talking about, so that, that will be kind of the big okay. news for us next week. Excellent. And, uh, and Dave, you said you're doing the UML thing. you doing anything else? Uh, I'm going by myself. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to tweet, or Karen will get mad at us if we don't tweet. Yeah, we should yeah, all exactly. be tweeting there. And the tag for that is EDW13. And I'm doing a workshop on Thursday afternoon on advanced data modeling, on keeping yourself happier and your team members happier. 
and adding value and making sure you maintain your relevance in your company. So that's what I'm doing, doing the blogging thing. I'm also moderating the lightning talks because as the two-time champion of the lightning talks, I've been not good anymore. So now I'm going to moderate those. That's uh, I forget what day that is. I think it, it might even be Monday, but that's a great kickoff. It's in the evening. I believe there are beverages, and people get to talk for five minutes and do their lightning talks. Um, and I think that pretty much right. Other than that, I'll be talking to a lot of people as well, so I'm excited about that. <laughs> um, and I get to the top of the hour, so it's time to wrap this up. Now, some of us, a panelist, I'd like to invite you, some of us stay on for a little bit so that we can participate in some of that. But the more part of this, the thing will be gone. We'll be chatting a little bit. Um, the recording will be turned off. That's the best part. And uh, I wanted to thank <laughs> Shannon for being our great moderator and editor for this and keeping us in line and getting us all here. I want to thank CA Technologies for sponsoring the webinar. I think that's really great. That shows great support for the community. I always love to see vendors supporting the community. And I thank all of our attendees because I consider you guys the fourth post here, especially with all your great chat and questions. So thank you so much. Shannon, you have something to wrap this up? Okay, I think you just said it all very well. You know, thank you to everyone, and uh, I really look forward to seeing everyone at EDW. That's uh, that's my way for EDW is meeting everybody I've worked with in these webinars, <laughs> <laughs> meeting them in person. <laughs> so, and of course, thank you to CA Technologies for for sponsoring. Again, you know, we just couldn't do it. Um, uh, produce these free webinars for you guys without their support and. Um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Another great discussion, Karen, and and thank you, plus Donna and David and Tom. Thank you so much for for a very energizing discussion on on data modeling today. And thank you. Thanks. So I'll turn off the recording. Let you guys, if you want to, uh, chat away and.